I think we should get started. Uh, we'll see how, how the time goes. Hi, Zvi. I how are you? you? I am, thank God, well. Wow. So I'm Zvi Hirschfield. I'm introducing myself to everyone. Uh, and our project uh, tonight, for me tonight, maybe it's today for some of you, is to do a quick review of getting one's kitchen ready for Passover according to traditional halachic standards. Uh, I want to be clear before we start, there are ranges of opinion on all these issues. I'll try to give you the range whenever I can, you know, call it up. I've been doing a lot of review, but uh, my intention is not to undermine anybody's practice uh, or imply that what you do is wrong and I know what's right. I'm simply going to share information with you to the best of my ability. And uh, if it's something you want to try for yourself, it will give you a certain framework to try, even if it's just a question of a point of comparison between your practice and what I'm showing you, it's all good. And if anybody, if I say anything that really made you crazy, you can, of course, tell me now. And you can also uh, send me uh, an email, which I will put in the chat right now, my secret email that no one's allowed to know. But I'll share it with you nice people. And I'm happy to try to be helpful from a distance. So before we begin, if, if people could maybe share a question or two that they've had about kashering for Pesach. Oh, and if I use any terminology that you're not aware of, please stop me. It's unintentional on my part and it's bad pedagogy. So I should, I'll have to do tshuva for that. But part of doing tshuva is fixing the problem. So you're going to tell me when I, uh, if I, you know, say something, it's not clear. But if people could share a question or two, that would be super helpful as a way of giving me a sense of what it is people want to focus on. But you got to go off mute. I have a question, but I think that it's a little bit more theoretical than it is practical. Okay, lay it on uh, me. Uh, my question is, um, Right, it, it, when we're celebrating this uh, holiday of liberation, why is there so much about things need to be kosher and things need to be restricted into a certain way? I mean, you don't find all these intense number of rules liberating, Peter, is that what you're saying? All right, maybe we'll try to talk about that a little bit at the end. And I think some of it has to do with competing notions of freedom and what freedom, are we celebrating freedom in the contemporary sense? Or are we celebrating leaving slavery in order uh, for spiritual uplift and serving God? And those may not be the same ideas or concepts, but if we have time, we'll come back to it. Um, Zvi, yes, I have a question. Uh, <clears throat> there's often conversation, and bear with me because I don't know the answer to this. That's why I'm asking it. But um, the uh, process, of, process of selling leavened... Um, like products in your house that you've purchased, the, the process of selling them back to the community, what is the significance of that? Like, I, I don't understand that, so I'd love to get into that. No problem, no problem. I'll, I, I'm mm -hmm. gonna begin with that one briefly. What else, anybody else with a question that they always wanted to know, this is their big chance? Yes, Anne. But you're on mute, Anne, we can't hear you. You're still on mute. There okay. you go. I'm trying to figure out, kashering the sink, the kitchen sinks. Okay, everything in the kitchen sink, we're going to cover it, not to fear. We got that covered. I've even brought a sink with me right there. See? Yes. I, I have a question. Yes. Um, uh, I, I have a real problem from an ecological standpoint of all the aluminum foil. Um, and... I would really like to be able to dispense with some of that or all of it. No problem. Most of what we're going to do does not require any aluminum foil at all unless you choose to use it. Okay, great. So there you go. Yes. I, I'm sorry. I don't know how to pronounce your name. What's oh, written there? I should change it. It's Yo Yochanan. I have my Hawaiian version. That I can pronounce. Prob <laughs> yeah, apologies. Um, no, not at all. My question is about like, it's similar to Pam's, but 
when you have like your sourdough starter, what did the Jews of old do with bread and fat? Excellent question. Okay, so let's begin with sort of the basics and we'll move from there. On Pesach, we have a prohibition from both owning and consuming leavened products. What's a leavened product? Anything made from the five grains that has been exposed to water for enough time that we say the leavening process would begin, which for us is 18 minutes or 12 minutes, give or take, whatever you're looking at, that is what makes something into chametz. Matzah, which is also made from one of the five grains, is not chametz because the time between the adding of the water to the flour and the rolling out and baking is very, very quick. They do that in three or four minutes. Therefore, it is matzah. But if I let that flour sit in water for more than 18 minutes, it then becomes chametz, and therefore, it is prohibited to consume or own. Standard chametz products in our homes are cereals, breads, pretzels, pasta, bagels. Oh, I made myself so hungry going through that list. But you get the basic idea. Uh, whiskey is also a chametz product. These are all chametz products. We are not allowed to consume them, and we're not even allowed to own them, which comes to Pamela's question right off the bat. So what do we do? So therefore, before Pesach, we are required to remove these items, either eat them or throw them out, or, or if they haven't been opened or they can be given to a food kitchen. For those items that we want to keep, starting in the Middle Ages, although it has its roots in earlier rabbinic discussion, there was a leniency developed to avoid severe financial loss that enabled a legal workaround where one could sell their chametz to a non-Jew for the duration of Pesach. Uh, this leniency really uh, took on much broader proportions in the 16th century and 15th century when Jews in Eastern Europe were heavily engaged in the whiskey business and distillers and were unable to survive Pesach which would, without using this leniency, which would also then include a sourdough baker who did not want to have to come up with a new starter, could also sell their sourdough to the non-Jew and after Pesach get it back. It is a legal workaround, it's a legal fiction, but many people use it today to cover expensive scotches or whiskeys or, or other items. And some people will even use it just to sell cereal, bagels, or pretzels are things that they don't want to get rid of. But the inception of this leniency was to prevent significant financial loss. That is the concept. And the way this is done today is we empower the rabbis of our communities. We write down our address and our phone number and where the chametz in our home is stored, right? We're supposed to gather and collect all that we're selling put it in one cabinet, mark that cabinet, and then the rabbi becomes our agent to sell the chametz to a non-Jew. In many communities, all the rabbis kind of join forces, they all bring their lists, and they sell the chametz all at one time to a particular non-Jew. It is a legal fiction, it is a legal workaround, but it's one that has been used by the Jewish people for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it is still used today. Now, What's the deal with cleaning our homes and koshering our kitchen? So in addition to removing chametz that we may own from our homes, the first thing we should know is chametz is not dirt or dust. The fact that people do spring cleaning and clean out their closets and vacuum their drapes has nothing to do with Pesach and just has to do with the idea that I really would like to get my house clean. We are only obligated halachically to clean those places where food has been brought, stored, or consumed. Now, people with small children or grandchildren or whatever, that could be all over your house, to be quite honest with you. But for most of us, what that means is that our bedrooms and our garages and other places do not require thorough cleaning or checking, nor do our bathrooms. But most of our energy is be directed towards the kitchen the, or the dining room, because that's where our food is located. 
Now, in particular, we only have to go after crumbs or small amounts of food, particularly in the kitchen, because on Passover, unlike other food prohibitions, even a trace amount of chametz is prohibited for ingestion, which means if a small breadcrumb falls into a great big soup pot, that would invalidate that entire soup pot, that entire bowl, uh, you know, pot of soup for Passover. So therefore, in our kitchens or in places where food is prepared, we try to work hard to clean and remove uh, chametz, where that chametz could end up in our food. So therefore, the cabinets where I store my Passover food, I'm going to clean very thoroughly. I am not, however, going to spend necessarily a lot of time cleaning up where cabinets where clean dishes are stored. Okay, just to give you an example of the difference. The other thing you may notice is because even trace amounts of chametz are prohibited, the custom is to buy and use only products that are labeled kosher for Passover, even if their ingredients show no chametz in them. Whether it's spaghetti sauce or tuna or yogurts or cottage cheese, even though in theory there may be no chametz in the manufacturing process, because of the stringency of Passover, the widespread custom is to only buy those products that are labeled kosher for Passover. There are certainly exceptions, uh, frozen vegetables in many cases, uh, fruit juices and other things. And that's the kind of thing you have to check locally. You go onto the website, you type in kosher for Passover Pittsburgh, and you will find the kashrut organization will tell you which items in your area do not require special supervision for Passover. Not hard to do, you can definitely do it, but that is why people order special products like spices and dairy products and cheese and all these things that are not chametz, but we still make a point of buying only those things that have been certified to have not been processed with any amount of chametz, either as a preservative, as an additive, or it does, wasn't even processed on a line where chametz also occur. Are we clear up until now? before we get into kosher the kitchen. Haley, was that pretty clear? Okay. So number one, of course, when we're cleaning our kitchen for Passover is we have to remove the actual chametz. Uh, crumbs, spills, other kinds of food that may be in our kitchen, all that has to be cleaned up uh, and taken care of. The more challenging part is not only the chametz that is still sitting there, the crumbs, the pretzel crumbs, the bagel crumbs, but in kashrut, there is an idea that when exposed to heat, vessels and utensils and, and countertops absorb flavor. In kashrut, there's something called balua, absorb flavor. And because of absorbed flavors, that's why you have meat pots and, and, and dairy pots. Because even when you're, when you're cooking a piece of meat in a pot, when the pot heats up, the idea is the pot will release flavor that's been absorbed previously. So the dairy pot that you made uh, spaghetti, uh, macaroni and cheese in will release cheese flavor into the meatballs that you're now cooking into that pot. The same thing is true of chametz. In order to make our cooking vessels and surfaces kosher for Pesach, we have to remove also the absorbed flavor of chametz that is in our sinks, ovens, countertops, microwaves, etc. And that's where the koshering process is really all about. The other important piece of information when it comes to koshering things is the principle of kibbo'o kach polto. As it is absorbed, so too it will be released. Meaning the same heating or cooking process that caused the material to absorb chametz flavor will also allow it to release the chametz flavor and therefore be kosher for Passover. That's the key principle. How it absorbed the chametz is how you will kosher it and release the chametz.
Any questions before we get start getting into the specifics? Okay, let's start with the easy ones. Okay, the easy one is the stovetop. Everybody see the stovetop there? Yes? It's a stovetop? You Would you agree that it's a stovetop, Peter? Yes, okay. I see the stovetop. So for the stovetop, stovetop is very easy. Step, step one is you would, first of all, you, you don't want to use it for anything chametz, or you really don't want to use it for 24 hours. The idea is that after 24 hours, the flavor that is released is a non-good flavor, right? So therefore, whatever gets released will not get reabsorbed and render it unfit. That's true of all the koshering we're going to do. You don't want to use anything for hot within 24 hours of your koshering process. So when I kosher this, I would first want to clean it. Mine's not terribly clean. In fact, it's a little schmutzig. I'm embarrassed. But in any event, I'd want to clean it thoroughly. So there are no crumbs. There's no grease stuff hanging around. Get it as clean as I can. I want to clean the burner. And I'd even maybe want to try to clean the grate as well. Now, to kosher the burner, all I have to do to kosher the burner is turn it on. And let it burn at its highest setting for 10 minutes. That will release any absorbed chametz in the burner. And the burner is now kosher for Passover. Not difficult at all. Now, what about... This guy. This guy can be handled in different ways. I can either dunk it in boiling water. Some people do that. I can also, with the pliers, not with my bare hand, hold it over the flame, heating up different parts of it. Again, releasing the chametz flavor from here. Or what I do is I simply put it in my oven and when my oven is being kosher, it koshers these things as well. Now, you might find some people also like to cover it with foil. You don't need to do that. Okay? What about this part here? Now, this part here, in theory, I don't put food on here. But since occasionally hot pasta falls there, and then on Pesach, my hot matzo brai falls there, I don't want my matzo brai to absorb the chametz flavor. So what I would do is I would clean it thoroughly. And then that middle part, that's where I might use some aluminum foil. Who is anti-aluminum foil? I apologize. But then I might want to cover this central part here with foil. If I'm really against using foil, I just have to remember that if something falls on here, I can't eat it. If it's hot. Okay. Can you, uh, Tzvi, I'm yeah. not sure what, what this or that refers to in terms so of. So I'm referring having... to this area over here. Oh, the center part. The okay. center and the, the, the uh -huh. surrounding area. Because okay. the problem is hot food does fall on that from time to time. And that would render it absorbing chametz. Okay. Okay, thank you. Are we all clear on the stovetop so far? Excellent. What Zvi, about the uh, I have an induction. Zvi, I have a, um, Zvi, I have a question, sorry. Um, I have an induction cooktop, so what do I do with that? Okay. Just wipe it clean? Well, so what you would do with that, I looked those up and how they work. They're really cool. Is that only gets hot when there's a pot on there? Yeah, that's it. That's exactly so it. what you would do is, first of all, you would clean the top, right? Remove any grease, stains, anything that you can remove. And then mm -hmm. you would put pots on each of the heating circles and let them get hot. And when the pot okay. is boiling, then you have koshered it. Some people also like to pour some boiling water on the parts in between. But don't do that if it will break it. Yeah, no, that sounds perfectly fine. So that's the way you Thank would come you. to induction or anything that is glass where the glass heats up. That's how you would kosher that. 
So you would boil water on each of the, the heating, heating circles. And then if you can, yeah. you could heat up water in one of these. And when the water is hot, you could pour it over the surface to get the parts in between the, the heating circles. Did that make sense? She froze. I have no way of knowing if that made sense. They, oh, sorry. Am I frozen still? No, you're back now. <laughs> Thank you. It does. Thank you. That makes perfect sense. I appreciate it. Okay. The oven. Hold on. I'm letting somebody else in here. Yeah, the sorry, oven. Now, just... if you have a self cleaning oven, then you get to do the self cleaning oven dance. Looks like this. Because all you do is you set it to self clean and you're done. You do, however, this is important. Hopefully, you can see. Oh, my oven's dirty. Sorry, everybody. You have to clean the areas that are not inside the oven though, right? In other words, you see over here, this is not inside the oven when the oven seals. So you have to clean the door and the areas outside and also any areas down here, right? You wanna to try to remove the grease and the food that's there. But fundamentally with a self-cleaning oven, you just turn it to self-clean and you're done. If you don't have a self-cleaning oven, what you would do is you would get some easy off and you wear gloves and a mask. We all have masks these days, the easiest Pesach ever for that. And you would wanna clean your oven to the best of your ability. There's gonna be stuff in there that's not gonna come out. Don't worry about it. It's not food anymore, it's charcoal by this point. But basically you would clean your oven just like the easy off instructions say to do it. And then you would turn the oven on to its highest setting for a half hour and then your oven is kosher for Passover. Now, some people would have you still cover the racks with aluminum foil, but Marilyn and I do not think that is necessary. And we think as long as the racks are clean and they've been heated up in the oven, the racks are good to go as well. Yes, Anne. You're still on mute, Anne. With the self-cleaning oven, they tell you to remove the racks when you're doing it. But I don't do that because otherwise the racks don't get kosher. They That's turn correct. Off. I they don't either. Off. It's because if you leave them in there, it dis they, they claim it discolors the racks. I can live with it. But so if you don't want to, then you would have to, then I would recommend koshering the racks by turning the oven on, cleaning the racks and turning the oven on to 450 or 475 right. and do it okay. that way. But I leave the racks in there. I even put so do I. I even put these in there when the oven is self-cleaning just to solve that problem. But keep in mind the oven's really dirty. You gotta wash the sides, you gotta wash the handles. Uh, um, the oven's kind of gross. You gotta go all the way around. It takes a little bit of time. That's one of the toughest jobs. Any questions about ovens? You guys still out there and still alive? How many people are terribly bored at this point? Please raise your hand. <laughs> Uh, you wouldn't tell me anyways. Okay, let's take a walk over to the other oven, to the microwave oven. Now, the microwave oven, oh, can you see my microwave oven now? Yeah. So the microwave oven also is not difficult to do. Again, you'd wanna clean it. Mine's not so clean, everyone. I apologize for that. But you'd wanna clean it thoroughly inside and out to the best of your ability, which isn't a bad idea in any event. And then you do two things. You would take like a bowl, a good sized bowl of water, and you would turn it on for like seven or eight minutes so it got all steamy in there. Because the steam is what's gonna kosher the microwave. Because the microwave, unlike your regular oven, the sides don't get hot. So you would use steam to kosher it. And then because this is made of glass, and Ashkenazim don't see glass as kosherable. You would clean this, and then some people dunk it in boiling water anyways. I would recommend just covering it with uh, some plastic or putting some paper towel down. Uh, don't put your, your Pesach dishes directly on here. That would be my recommendation. Put some kind of liner or something or wrap it in plastic wrap uh, thoroughly uh, for Pesach. 
you will find some people who think you should only use the, even after doing all that, you should only put things in there covered. I think that's uh, very stringent, but some folks will do that. Okay. Easy peasy on the microwave. I have a question about the microwave. What yes, uh, Haley. What kind of a bowl or of do you use in there? Does it have to be a koshered bowl, um, like something that's already kosher for pesto? Does it matter? I mean, ideally, uh, you don't want to use a chametz vessel when you're koshering. In this instance, yeah. So you'd be you're you know yeah. I would say if you don't have one, then take a styrofoam or something that. Uh, but yeah, a, a pesadic a, a pesach bowl would be preferred. Absolutely. Uh, if not, you can take a regular bowl, but just spritz some cleaner into the water to make to you know make the water what's called pagum to kill the taste, and you can do it that way. But it'd be preferable to take a pesach bowl if you can. Uh, uh, it works very well. A glass uh, mixing, uh, or you could take a glass uh, measuring bowl, measuring cup. Those work well I, too. Yeah. I don't think it's a good. I don't think it's a good idea to put plastic in a microwave. But what I do is I put, um, a, I take a paper cup, disposable paper cup. There, that's a nice one. And I put uh, the hot, the water in there. That's a good one too. Yeah. My wife pointed out my knowledge of this is pretty theoretical since she normally does a lot of it. She's, still, you know, she's upstairs. I think she was exaggerating personally, but that's what she said. So, you know, I'm not going to fight with her. Okay. Countertops. Countertops are really easy. Okay. Countertops, especially if they're, they're marble or they're wood, both of those are kosherable materials which means what you would do is you would clean them thoroughly, get into the cracks, whatever you can, clean it all thoroughly. Don't let anything hot on them for 24 hours. And then you would boil water and just simply pour boiling water over it, one strip at a time. Now you have to be very careful. It's gonna get the floor very wet. So you wanna have towels ready. You wanna have a, uh, a sponge thing like this ready to get the water off into the sink because it's going to make it can make a bit of a mess and you're going to want to try to cover with direct flow as much of the countertop as you can now, Svi, what about the stone countertops that are so common in israel well so stone like granite is kosherable some people say things like evan kesar uh, cesarean stone. Some people have stringencies with that because they claim the clay is mixed in. I don't know what to tell you. You can look, the Star K site has a list of which materials are kosherable. The problem is that clay, halakhically speaking, is not kosherable. Anything made from clay or pottery or ceramics is seen as it absorbs, but it doesn't release. So that, that's the issue that's being raised here. But most surfaces are kosherable, and especially because the, the, the possibility of transfer from your countertop to your Passover pot is very unlikely. Some people eat on Pesach, even though they've koshered the countertop, some people will use uh, trivets, so they don't put anything hot directly on their countertop. We, we don't put anything directly hot in our countertop generally just because we think it's bad for the countertop, but some people do. But you kosher with boiling water. Now, if you don't want to pour boiling water and you don't mind using aluminum foil or something else, you could simply clean the countertop and cover it. Either with aluminum foil. Some people I know uh, have like these hard plastic, they're almost like cutting board material that they had made for their countertop that they use for Pesach, they simply drop that on there and they're done. And that's their method. One thing is you will find people who do both. You do not need to both kosher and cover. That is really excessive. I mean, if you want to do it, you can, but that's not halakhically required. Any questions about countertops? They're the easiest. They're just a little messy and involved. Yes, Peter. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering about the the covering. Um, you you kind of answered it with like just the cutting board situation. I like yeah. 
what I'm thinking about is just like, I never put anything on my countertop unless that there's a cutting board there anyway. So as long as the cutting board is kosher, is that still? Well, the cutting board though, it still might be chametz though, right? In other but words, the here's the idea. Be- Let's say this is a hot pot of pasta, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and water has dripped over. When I place this very hot pot, I take it off the stove and I put it on here in principle. A chametz flavor has now been absorbed into the conquer cup. I'm not saying it happens all the time. That's why a lot of this is, is being a little stringent. But that's the concern. And that's why we say I have to kosher the countertop. But instead of kosher it, you could put Passover covers down on top of your countertop instead. I just know that when people use aluminum foil to cover the countertop, it gets very dirty after a short period of time. And then it gets kind of gross. Like by day three of Pesach, often like water is seeped in underneath the aluminum foil and uh, food gets into the cracks, the aluminum foil, and then it starts to get very messy. I guess my question was how, like if you, if you opt for the, the covering method, does the whole countertop need to be covered or just enough of it that you have enough space to do what you need to do? Just the part that you're going to use. If you're not going to put anything down on the other parts, then in principle, it wouldn't have to be covered. So it might be a question of how much workspace you feel you need and what's comfortable and so on. Remember, when you put something cold or in a package on any surface, it doesn't render it unfit for Passover, right? If I take a box of matzah, I could put a box of matzah on top of a bag of bread. The matzah did not absorb bread you know, from the, uh, uh, from the bag of bread up through the, the matzah box into the matzah. It's only through heat and water transfers that we're concerned about food uh, things being absorbed. So if you're just using the counter for only cold things, in, in, in theory, all you would have to do is clean it to make sure there are no crumbs or gook laying on it but there'd be no concern of, of transfer from the countertop into your Pesach pots. By the way, something like this that's only used for water, presumably you could use this for Pesach as well. It's never had anything chametz inside of it. Other questions, yes. Even though there might be the possible, oh, sorry. Even though there might be the possibility of a crumb being on the countertop when you use the kum kum or whatever. But again, let's say there's a crumb on the countertop where I'm pouring my cup into the, into my glass. How did that make nothing? The crumb can't render this chametz, right? Point touch the cup. Again, the cup doesn't have chametz either, right? Right. But you're right. Let's say if I, I did ask this question, if I use this to pour into hot oatmeal, to make instant oatmeal, and the steam from the oatmeal, you know, rises up into here, so then maybe you could, you could have something to worry about. What about the, 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 the urn that you use for Shabbat? The what hot. a great question. I happen to have one here. Let me see if you can see. Oh, me too. <laughs> right. I have an urn, okay? So if I only use this thing for water, then it's kosher for Passover, just like uh, all year round. Good. However, some people, I am one of them, like to put things on top to warm up on Shabbat. Then you that can. creates a problem, especially if I put challah up here to warm or other things. Oh. That, creates a, that creates a more difficult challenge. It is kosherable. I would kosher it by filling it up to the top having it boil and then putting like a hot uh, spatula or something in there to cause it to overflow. And that would kosher it and run boiling water out of the spout. And that would kosher it. This guy would still be a problem. Yeah. But I could either immerse him in boiling water, like I'll show you a little bit later on, or I could simply, sorry, Marilyn, wrap him in foil. All right. But what that's about a only if I, if I put chametz up here to warm up on Shabbat. 
If I've only used this for hot water, there's no reason in the world it shouldn't be kosher for Passover, just as it is right now. If you want to be extra certain, so you can boil it up and then run some, and then turn the spigot on just to run some boiling water through the tap before Pesach. And a coffee maker? Again, a coffee maker. Same thing. If I've only ever used it for, for making coffee, then I don't see why it would be chamez. Now, sometimes people use flavored coffees. Maybe someone's going to say, but maybe the carafe has sat in the sink and had contact with hot chametz. I hear all that. You'd have to sort of figure out from your own use. But for example, this guy, an espresso, you guys see that? Can't see any way that thing became chametz over Pesa. So you kind of have to just use your own judgment there in terms of what you're willing to, to use or to do. You could also use your coffee maker without the carafe, right? You could just put a cup under there. Let me pause now before we go on to sinks and other fun stuff. Any questions I should have covered and did not make clear? Anybody? Okay, ready to keep, we're gonna keep plugging ahead. All right, let's talk about sinks. I have one question. Sure. Yeah. Sometimes there's a skinny space between the oven and a counter, and there's like no way you could get in there to clean. How do you, what do you deal with? Mean like that? With that? Yeah, correct. So look, I personally pull the oven out and clean back there because I have to do it once a year because it's gross. I also clean behind the fridge once a year too. In terms of chametz, the crumbs or junk that fell down there is not considered what you had, when you do bitul chametz and cancel and nullify your chametz before Passover begins, which is the ceremony that we do when we burn the chametz, right? It includes anything that may have fallen down there. Not to mention the fact that nothing that fell down there is really edible at this point in any of it. It's still a good idea to move your oven out, I think, and clean just because it's a good idea to move your oven oh, out. Great job. But Passover wise, I don't think it's a problem. By the way, I should, before I mention, your refrigerator does not need to be kosher or lined with paper. Don't line your refrigerator. It kills the fan. All you have to do with your refrigerator is clean it. Right? Because it, it has food stored in there, but the food is all cold. All you have to do is clean it and then you can put all of your Passover items right into the fridge. Wow. No costuring for the fridge, but it is a pain to clean well. Hate cleaning the fridge, one of the worst jobs in the house. Because something is always spilled back there and no one noticed. Or they did and they pretended not to notice and waited for somebody else to come along and be like, why is the salad dressing stuck to the shelf of the fridge? <laughs> It was me. I'm sorry, Svi. Huh? I said it was me. I'm sorry. I believe that, actually. Okay, let's talk about sinks. You all know the principle, right? If chametz, like hot noodles or hot, uh, I don't know, what else? Hot noodles, hot lasagna, you name it, whatever got, whatever got dumped into your sink. So the sink has now absorbed chametz flavor. What's going to remove the chametz flavor? Once again, boiling water man. Boiling water man kills chametz man. In the war of chametz versus Pesach. So what you would do again with your sink is you would clean your sink thoroughly, not use it for 24 hours, and then again, boiling water over the whole surface of the sink. And ideally, don't forget to clean your faucet and if you can, pour a little boiling water here as well, just in case anything had any contact. Now, if you have a porcelain sink, is it porcelain? Yeah. Most people have stainless steel, but if you have porcelain, porcelain is not kosherable. It's like clay. 
So what you would do in that instance is you would clean it thoroughly and then you would need to get a liner or a bin for the sink. But most people I think have stainless steel sinks. Also, don't forget, it's not a bad idea. You have to, you have to kosher or, and clean this guy as well because he also had a lot of chamed sitting in him. But see, sinks are easy. Anybody else? I think my, my overriding concern about Pesach and other holidays in Israel, which is where I live, is the amount of waste um, from an ecological standpoint, disposable this, disposable that, the garbage cans are always overflowing here. And yep. I really would love to see a way to reduce that. Well, look, nothing that I described has required the use of, you know, disposable anything. It's just a question of convenience. People like the convenience of disposable stuff. You know, it's, it, it's as much, it, I don't know if it's related to Passover. I think on Sukkot also, when people are hosting a lot, and doing a lot of meals at home, it's more convenient to use, you know, chad pami, you know, disposable. Yeah. It's... But it's not about the halacha. The halacha does not require anything disposable. That's just a question of how people, you know, want to it's make cultural. more manageable. Right. So I don't have a good answer for that, but it's not a Pesach thing because Jews were doing Pesach long before disposable anything even existed. Right. No, I so just I see it as very problematic. I understand. Uh, Before we get to costuring utensils, let's talk about dishwashers. Oh, okay. Hmm. There is the lenient approach and there's the more stringent approach. Okay? okay. The lenient approach says that all you have to do is clean, make sure there is no food particles, like clean out the trap of your dishwasher. Clean also, oh man, my dishwasher is not even clean right now, but food gets trapped in these things, right? Clean all the food out of your dishwasher thoroughly from these, from the, uh, anybody have the word for these? Ask. Huh? Trap. <laughs> Utensil and then run the dishwasher on the hot on the hottest cycle. Some folks will tell you that it is preferable to take the racks and either take them to your local koshering place where they have those great big enormous uh, pots of boiling water and immerse them in boiling water. In the absence of that, to pour, remember, who's going to kill Hummets, man, Haley? It's boiling water, man. Boiling water, man. To pour boiling water on the racks directly. I'm just telling you both, and then run it on the cycle of the hottest cycle. The other thing some folks insist on doing, again, this is all a question of how you want to approach it is they will put some dish soap in the bottom of the dishwasher before they use it on Passover. I'll tell you why. In a regular dish cycle, first uh, water heats up on the bottom of the dishwasher, then it spritz all over the dishes, then the soap is dropped into the bottom, and then hot soapy water hits the dishes, and then hot water rinses it off. The concern is if the dishwasher is not kosher for Passover to a serious enough level, then when the first cycle begins, you're basically spritzing chametz water on your Passover. I, I've you never, that's the problem. I've the never day. heard of dishwashing soap in a dishwasher. I did it once by accident and I had soap suds so this, all right. over. No, well this, I'm explaining why. Okay, I'm just explaining why. You don't need to use a lot, you use like a spoonful. Because then, as soon as hot water comes out, it's hot soapy water. And remember I told you, negative flavors cannot impart prohibition. So hot soapy water 
will not cause prohibited chametz to be absorbed into the dishes. So you've got three options there. Either just clean it and just run the cycle at its hottest setting, use it normally. Clean it. And before you use it each time on Passover, put a teaspoon of dish soap at the bottom of the, uh, the dishwasher. Or number three, uh, immerse the racks in boiling water or pour boiling water on top of the racks uh, before running the cycle. Don't use it. Those are all options with the dishwasher. Tzvi, you mentioned about taking the racks to a place that does Pesach koshering. Yeah. Is there a, uh, a master list or resource of where you, those I places think you, are? I think in America, I think many of the local synagogues do it. Uh, and in Israel, I think if you just Google it, you'll find the, the closest one near you. It, it'll be at a synagogue, a community center. Where it won't be hard to find. Okay, thanks. You can bring anything there. Just make sure whatever you bring there, make sure it hasn't been used for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay, we did the dishwasher, we did the microwave. Wait, me. Yes. You didn't give the strict version for the dishwasher. Well, <clears throat> well, I said the strict version is to immerse the racks. Oh. Uh, and then there's the strictest version is you can't you, you can't kosher a dishwasher for Paso. Right. There's always a stricter version that says you just can't do anything. <laughs> so don't worry. <laughs> that one is always implied. <laughs> Any questions on what I cover before we start talking about koshering utensils? Haley, did you have a question? Your hand went up. How's everybody's energy level? You still able to absorb? Get it? Absorb? Absorb? No? <laughs> a little Passover country joke? Okay. Let's start with the easy stuff. Silverware. Silverware for costuring for Pesach is really easy. Make sure the silverware is clean. Make sure it hasn't been used for 24 hours. And then you would take a Pesach pot or a costuring pot, not a chametz pot, and once the water in there was boiling, you would simply immerse the silverware. It doesn't have to sit in there for three minutes. In, out. Now, you should not be holding on to the silverware with your hand, because what happens if you hold on to silverware with your hand and hold it under boiling water? You burn your hand. So therefore, what you should, you would want to get what really works nicely. Let's see if I have that bag. Yes, a net bag. A net bag that either you use for laundry or a net bag that they bring that potatoes come in. You guys know what I'm talking about? Uh -huh. Those work really well. You put the silverware in there, you dunk it in, you shake it around a little bit, you remove it, then you put it into cold water. Have a pan or another pot of cold water standing by, and you are good to go. That's it for silverware. And for knives peelers, anything like that, that's very easily done, okay? What about pots, okay? So a smaller pot, again, you'd wanna, again, clean it thoroughly in the little cracks to the best of your ability, right? If it's got handles that come off, remove the handles. If it doesn't, don't remove them because you'll break the pot. The same principle applies. When you're on time, you can kosher it by getting it here and then getting it that way. Is that clear what I just did? Probably not. You could go this way, take it out, turn it around, and then immerse it this way. And that also works for koshering. Okay? Now, the koshering pot should be a pot that is not a chametz pot for the obvious reason that you don't want the pot to release chametz flavor into the stuff that you're koshering. So it should be a kosher for Passover pot. Now, at the same time, you got to make sure that uh, nothing that you're dipping in there has been used for chametz in the last 24 hours, or eventually the pot will absorb 
enough chametz from the stuff you're kashering that it will become a chametz pot. You'll be making chametz soup. If you want to ensure that that's not a problem, what you can do, oh, I have it here, is you, ah, oh, there it is. You can take one spritz of spritz cleaner into the water and then it doesn't matter because then the flavor is all going to be destroyed by the spritz cleaner and it'll be kosher no matter what. Chametz man is afraid of spritz cleaners as well, by the way. Boiling Does water. that include soap? Huh? D does a spritz cleaner include soap? Yeah, Is you soap? can use a little soap too, but soap sometimes can make a lot of bubbles and then you got a big problem. But yeah, you could use a little bit of soap too if you want. What's a spritz cleaner? Here. One of these guys. Oh. Right? One, one shot into the water. And you're covered. Okay. What about now? That all works because all of these, the silverware, it's all absorbed through a liquid medium. Things that have absorbed chametz through a dry medium are really not kosherable for Pesach. Let me give you the examples uh, cake tins, muffin tins, uh, a griddle. Those things requ require a level of burning that would ruin the pan. So they are really not kosherable. A Teflon pan that has been used without oil or butter, I'll talk about that in a minute, is not really kosherable on Pesach because it would require what's called libun chamur, a level of burning that is so high it would ruin the pan. The only kind of things really that can be kosher to that level is like a barbecue grate or something like that, uh, where you would burn it with a blowtorch. But otherwise, muffin tins, cake tins, bunt pans, uh, none of those things really are ever kosher for, pa for Passover. We just put those away. We clean them and put them away and we don't use them. Toaster ovens also. Toaster ovens are considered so filled up with crumbs that we don't kosher them for Passover. That's the practice. We just put, we clean them out as best we can, and then we put them away. Now, an interesting uh, exception is the frying pan. If you have something that is too big or too unwieldy to immerse into boiling water, you can also do what's called libun kao, which means heating it to the point where the underside would cause like a tissue to brown. I'm gonna show you an example. We'll see if this works right now. Tell me if you can see the pan. Can you see the pan over here? Yeah. I even brought some tissues here there. See this one here? Nope, not yet. So what happens if I hold this here? Let's assume this has been cleaned. It hasn't been used for 24 hours. And every time I've used it with chametz, there's been oil or butter or some kind of buffering medium, which allows me to kosher it this way, not have to use a blowtorch. However, to kosher it, I have to make sure I get each part hot enough. No, nope, not yet. Where I would touch a tissue to it and the tissue would turn a little bit brown. I guess it takes longer than I thought or my flame isn't very hot. No, nope, not yet. This must be really exciting to watch, huh? <laughs> But basically, I would rotate the pan all the way through until each part of it got hot enough. Either this is the most resilient tissue I've ever owned mm. <laughs> or the worst range I've ever had to use. Wow. Wow. Well, we'll give it another minute or so, but that is how I would kosher a frying pan, okay? 
Now, I want to emphasize uh, the costuring of pans and pots and silverware. If you believe that Pesach is going to be a part of your life for the long term, it is worth the investment to get a separate set just for Passover. Of, of basic pans and silverware. I'm not talking about a whole massive fancy kitchen. I'm saying enough basic items because kashering can be a little bit of a hassle. So let's see if this is hot enough yet. Well, we're getting closer, I think. Okay. I give up. It's unconscionable. But in any event, that is the way I would do what's called libun kal. You can do that, by the way, with anything that you would dip into boiling water. You could also kosher that way as well. Do not do it for knives or silverware because you'll ruin them. But for anything else, you could use that, that, that methodology as well. Uh, just to clear up some myths, sticking silverware into the dirt does not kosher it for Passover. <laughs> Doesn't work. Now, in terms of soaking, if you have, let's say I have cups that I have used for whiskey or beer. And let's say the beer sat in those cups for more than 24 hours. I can always dip them in boiling water, but if I'm worried that that will ruin them, I can also uh, simply fill, uh, put them in water, like in a bin with water. I just have to change the water every 24 hours for three days. However, in general, anything that's only been used for cold just needs to be clean, does not need to be kosher. If I have a kiddush cup, that I've only used for grape juice or wine, I do not need to kosher that kiddush cup for Passover. I can just wash it and then use it. Mm. Okay? If you want to kosher, if you want to dip it in boiling water, you can. No harm done, but it's not necessary or essential. Anything that's been used only for cold does not, tr does not impart chametz flavor or absorb chametz flavor and therefore would not need to be kosher. Okay, we covered a lot, holy cow. Can I ask about the, the things that are only use cold? Does that apply to all materials? Yes. Great, cool. Only for cold, like what are you thinking of? Well, I was just, I, I mean, it's all a mishmash in my head sometimes, but the things, you know, even if you, if, whether or not you believe that glass can be koshered is a totally right. different question, right? Because that means that cold glass things that have only been used for cold can just be clean. Right, even more so. Let me clarify the whole glass thing, okay? Glass was debated in the Middle Ages in terms of its status. Some commentators felt that glass never absorbs anything. It can never become... Uh, Milchik, it can never become fleshik, it can never become chametz. It's the perfect material that absorbs nothing. Others believe it absorbs everything. It's like clay, and once it absorbs, it can't ever release it. It's the worst material. And others say it's the middle ground. It's like metal, it absorbs and releases. What does this mean? It means that Sfaradim uh, follow the lenient view. The glass does not absorb. Therefore, they don't kosher glass. They will use glass for both milchik and fleshik, if you only have one set of dishes, things like that, as long as it's all clean. So for Passover, they will simply wash the glass stemware and then bring it out for Pesach. Ashkenazim take the stringent view on Pesach and therefore view glass as unkosherable for Pesach. So if you have glass dishes that have been used for chametz, hot chametz, you would not be able to kosher those dishes for Passover from the Ashkenazic perspective. But you are saying that if you had a wine glass that was glass and only ever used for things that were cold. Correct. Now, some fine. people will say, but what if happens if it was in the sink and hot chametz got on it? Even so, if you're only using it for cold, it still will not impart chametz into your cold wine that you're drinking. Having said that, a lot of people still want to use something separate for Passover and so on and so on, which I understand, but it is not technically it would not be chametz. 
any other questions or something I should have covered or that you're curious about? Okay, I want to, I'm going to close because that was a lot to absorb. Again, I love using that pun. Uh, ah, one last thing, a plata. You guys know what a plata is? What yes. you heat Shabbat food on? Very, very simple. All you do for that is you clean it thoroughly. Uh, then don't use it for 24 hours. Turn it on for 20 or 30 minutes. And then, oh, is Marilyn still here? She's going to be upset. Oh, no, Marilyn's off. I can say this. Then you would have, that is something you would have to cover. It doesn't get hot enough to really kosher fully. So you'd have to cover it in foil <laughs> to use it for Pesach. That's the norm with the plata. So clean it, turn it on and let it get hot for a half hour. And then, then after it cools down, cover it with foil, uh, like a thick aluminum foil, and then you are uh, good to go. So I want to, yes, Yochanan. Sorry, I might not be relevant, but just very briefly, since you have the, your hand on the pulse in, uh, you know, Jewishly, what is this? What are people doing nowadays with making their own matzah? Is it coming into vogue or is it completely a fringe thing? Uh, I don't know if it's fringe. I think the problem is typically to make your own matzah, you need some kind of specialized brick oven. I don't think your standard oven gets hot enough to make matzah properly. There are some people who build their own brick ovens. I think it's not so dissimilar from a pizza oven if you want to know the truth, but also then could only be used for matzah, right? You couldn't use it as a pizza oven and then try to use it for matzah. That would be problematic. Uh, some people as groups rent time and space at matzah factories. Really? So they go as a group and they make their own matzah. I've never done it. Uh, it seems kind of fun. Maybe I would try it one year, but I've never done it. So it's a nice idea. It's a lovely idea, but I, I think Making it in your own home oven is challenging. I just don't think it gets hot enough. I think matzah is cooked at a very intense high heat. Yeah, and because those stone ovens are stone, uh, once they, they can't really be koshered even if you fire them. Uh, it depends. If they're clay, then they could not be. That's correct. Okay. But I don't think anybody would really feel comfortable baking their matzah in a chametz oven. I no, just interesting probably, what people used to do in the back in the day, you know. Uh, back in the yeah. day, I, I get the impression when they made soft matzah, then it's like a different, a different animal altogether. They do it like on a taboon kind of thing, oh, okay. uh, which I have seen. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, how they, I, I guess they did kosher bakery ovens on some level. They would, you know, make a roaring fire in there uh, and heat it up to a crazy temperature. Oh, we'll I guess that's that for the would, <laughs> We'll save that for the deep. We'll save that for the dissertation. Yeah, Correct. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I do want to emphasize before we close, uh, preparation for Pesach should not only be about cleaning. Uh, you should take some time to reflect on the themes of the holiday. Look at the Haggadah. Think about how you want your Seder to look. Think about how you want the holiday to affect you, right? Don't spend all your time on the Kashrut element. There are a lot of other things to enjoy about the Chag. I think, Peter, you asked a great question. In what sense can we view mitzvot as, uh, and details as being empowering or uplifting as opposed to only limiting and constraining? I think that's a deep, interesting issue that doesn't have a simple answer, right? But I think at the same time, there is something about our ability to serve and to express our commitment by paying close attention to detail that uh, does enhance our sense of dignity and personal responsibility. But it is not the sense of freedom of, I am free to do whatever I choose at this moment. It is definitely a different type of freedom that I think uh, Pesach is coming to instill and celebrate.